Well, good morning. It is great to be with you guys. Do you know that you're dearly loved? Show of hands. How many know that you're dearly loved? How many of you don't know that you're dearly loved? Show of hands. Just, to, okay, tell that person right there. Tell him, tell him. He's dearly loved. All right. Uh, it is great to be with you guys. You are dearly loved, and I am excited about being together today, and I'm excited about what God wants to do in us today uh, as we come to the conclusion of our fall focus. Before we get to that, I, I want to bring us back to where we were about two weeks ago when we jumped into uh, this Christmas adventure. Uh, we gave you guys all a couple weeks ago this gold envelope. Uh, let's see if I can pull mine out. Oh, there it is. Uh, your Christmas adventure. How many of you guys got these? Like hands went very, very low. They were like, I did, just don't look at me. Uh, and then how many of you guys have not gotten one yet? All right, a couple of you guys have not gotten, make sure you pick one of these up on your way uh, out today. They're back at these different stations. And the idea here is very simple, that everyone needs a friend, a genuine friend, to help them find their way back to God. Everybody needs that. And here's the, the beautiful thing is, God is looking to use you and me to be those kinds of friends. We say, how in the world do we do that? Well, here comes your Christmas adventure. We've given you a tool to help you to take steps in this season to be the friend that someone needs to find their way back to God. And one of the, the, the most helpful pieces of this is this page. It's kind of a, a list of different things underneath the word blessed. When you look at yours and you have that page, I really want to encourage you, especially in this holiday week, you may have some great opportunities to do some of the things that are on this page to help build that relationship. The idea is that we would identify one person, we would invest in them, and in, in time, and if it's appropriate for this season, We've designed our Christmas services so that you can bring that person with you and they can come to understand the gospel and respond to the great news of Jesus Christ this Christmas season. So I want to encourage you, take this out today if you have one. If you don't have one, grab one and open it and go to this page and pray over, God, how can you use this week? What do you want to do through me this week? What thing can I do to advance my friendship with this person that they may come to know you in the days to come? Speaking of prayer, I want to take a moment. I want to pray with you. So if you guys would bow your heads. And, and I want to pray a very, very simple prayer, but a profound prayer with you. And uh, I, I'm going to give you the prayer before we pray it. Uh, and the point of that is so that you, you can make this yours. And, and the prayer is very simple. It's this. Dear God, please speak to me and I will respond. That's what we're going to pray. And so in this moment... If that's really what you want today, you want to hear from God in our time together right now, and you are willing, if he will help you to respond accordingly, then would you pray this with me? Dear God, please speak to me, and I will respond. Thank you for what you're going to do as we continue in our time together this morning. Thank you for who you are who you are in our lives, what you're doing in and through the body of believers here at North. Thank you for what you want to accomplish in us today. And thank you that you're enough. So we trust you now. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, when I was in college, uh, my two roommates and myself took a class together. It was a swimming class. And it was a very basic swimming class. Uh, and after one of the classes, our professor, his name was Kai Tagami, super cool guy. Uh, you can just tell by the name, he's a cool guy, he's Kai Tagami, just like to say it, Kai Tagami. You can do it with me, ready? Kai Tagami. So wasn't that fun? Okay, so afterwards, he grabbed the three of us and he said, hey, I want to tell you guys about a thing. Uh, so here's, a, here's the deal. If you guys go up onto not just the regular diving board, but the high dive, and you stand on the edge of the high dive, and you turn around, and you, you, you put your hands together over your head and you stiffen your body and you fall off, you'll do a perfect dive. And we said, that's great, show us. And he said, no, 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 no. I want you guys to go and try this. And so we're like, uh, yeah, you go, no, you go, no, you go. We're like, ah. And I was just young enough and still a little too eager for things that, that were not safe and smart. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I'll be the one, I'll go, I'll do this. So I, I went over to the high dive and I was like, okay, I know the whole plan I've, I've thought about. I know what's coming, how it's gonna work. And, and, and I'm, I, okay, I'm going up. So I climb up, this is climbing. Okay, I climb up the ladder. See how I'm going up? Okay, and I get to the top and I walk out to the edge of the diving board and I look down. I'm like, I have come off of high dives before. I, this is gonna be fun. 
Uh, this is great. I'm just going to jump in that water. It's going to be great. Uh, and then um, I know. How, so I turned around, and everything was cool until I did that. I turned around, and all of a sudden, I'm going to fall backwards into this water. Listen, I've fallen on water before from heights. It hurts really, really bad if you don't go in right. And I can't see to go in right. You want me to fall off this thing? And all of a sudden, fear, whoosh, went up through. It was like, this is crazy. Who would in their right mind do this? I, and so I, like started, I walked like halfway back off the board and I just kind of considered like, is this really what I do? They're like, go ahead, go ahead. I'm like, yeah, you come up here. And we had a big argument. Uh, and, and I got back out on the edge. I thought, okay, Whew. here we go. And I put my toes on the edge and I thought, okay, here we go. Do I really trust that what he said is going to happen or am I really going to die? I, I, I had a choice to make. Do I fall off this diving board from what felt like eight stories in the air or, you know, or not? Or, or do I just climb back down the ladder? What do I do? I had a choice to make and you and I have a choice to make today. You and I are standing on, a, on the edge of a diving board, so to speak, where we have spent this, this fall together, these past 10 weeks getting to that point, the point of decision. We've spent uh, a lot of our time together simply clarifying what it is to, to follow Jesus, that the call of Jesus requires clarity. We, we looked at several things uh, this fall together as we looked at the very words of Jesus that he would explain to us what he means when he says, follow me. The first thing that we saw was he said that there is going to be change that takes place. If you're going to follow me, there's going to be change. I'm going to change you. There's a schedule that might change. There's a priority that might change. Relationship might change in some way. There's a change. And there's this choice that you have to make. No one can make it for you. It's not automatic. You don't fall into this. It's not accidental. You must make a choice. And we saw that, that this idea that you have to deny yourself that you have to, to stop being the one leading your life and then you turn and you take up your cross and give Jesus the rightful place of leading your life. And to follow him, we saw, was not just something we do every now and then, it's something that we have to choose again and again and live out every single day. And we do so in a very personal way. It's a relationship. It's not some regimented ritual or religious activity. It is living out the relationship that we have with Jesus. And we do so publicly, that our, our, our relationship with Jesus, our following of Jesus is a very personal thing, but it's not a private thing. And there's obedience that we would follow him obediently with him in charge, and we'd follow him radically, committed to him. We saw this this past fall together. This is what it looks like, according to Jesus, to follow him. And then this past week, this past Sunday, we looked at the idea that he tells us to consider the cost. We need to consider it. Not only do we understand it and know what it is to do it, but when we get to the edge of that diving board, we've got to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Do I really want to do this before I would say yes to following him? I would consider it. And so after understanding it, clarifying what Jesus meant, and considering what Jesus has called us to, which is, to give him everything, it costs everything. We're left with where we kind of started this fall, the second week, we're circling back to the choice. We knew we needed to make a choice and today we come to a place where we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice now that we understand and now that we consider it. In Luke chapter nine, we saw this back in the second week of the fall focus and it said this in in. Luke 9, 23, and he, that's Jesus, said to all, and what's that little tiny two-letter word underlined and bolded, everybody? Yeah. If, and if you see the word if, it means it's a choice. He says, if anyone would come after me, meaning you don't have to. You don't have to come after me. I'm inviting you to come, and if you want to, if you so choose. He begins to explain, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, the question that you and I are left with today is, will I choose 
to follow Jesus. It's a choice that we have to make. You see, there's only two, two answers to that question, right? Either the answer is, yes, I will, or no, I won't. There's only two options. There's no other alternatives. Jesus says, follow me. He says that to you. He says that to me. And today, now that we know what it is and we've considered it, we have to answer the question with either a yes or a no. Will I follow Jesus? And if today you would say, I don't think so. No. I, I'm not going to choose to follow Jesus today. The answer might be because I don't really get this whole following Jesus thing and I'm not ready to, to do that. Or, you know, I, I, I don't really have a desire. I hear it, I see it, I understand everything. is. I don't really have anything driving me towards that. I don't really want that. And maybe you'd say, it sounds good, but the cost is really steep. I'm not sure I want to pay that kind of price and give him everything. The cost is too high. One day, a young man came to Jesus. Uh, and most believe he was one of the rulers in the Jew Jewish synagogue. He came to Jesus and he said, hey, Jesus, by the way, I just want you to know I'm awesome. Uh, and I also just wanted to, to see how do I get eternal life? And here's what we have to understand, that the eternal life and following Jesus are not two separate things. They're one and the same. We come to Jesus and he rescues us and gives us eternal life as we follow him and let him be the leader of our life. It's, it's combined. And so he says, I'm looking for eternal life. Jesus knows what he's asking is, really, am I going to follow you? And Jesus knows this about following him, that it's either fully committed to him or not. And he looks at this man and he says, I know where your heart is. It is fully committed elsewhere. He was totally committed to his wealth. He found his identity in it. He found his security in it. His love and his passion was in his wealth. And Jesus knew he was not going to be able to follow him with a love affair with his wealth at the same time. And so he simply lovingly, Scripture says, looked at him and said, go and sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And that man, his countenance fell. And Scripture says he went away sad. And we have no record of him ever coming back in the scriptures. He said, no, the cost is too high. And maybe today that's where you are and you're saying, that's, that's me, that's my story. Jesus is calling for a lot and I'm not ready for that. What I would tell you is this, that is fantastic that you are being intellectually honest. There's absolutely no way for anyone to move forward in life if they won't be honest about where they are. So if that's where you are, I am so excited that you're being honest about it. That's wonderful. But at the same time, in all humility, I would plead with you to reconsider. To not leave yourself in a place of no and be satisfied. Because what we're talking about here, what Jesus is calling us to, he makes very clear in scripture, is the greatest decision you can possibly make in your entire life. And to simply turn away and walk away from it without further considering it, without pressing in further to it, I would really hope that you would not do that. For what Jesus offers you is greater than anything else there is. And today you may not be saying no. You might even be in the majority in a church setting where you would be say, I want, you'd be saying, I want to say yes. I don't want to say no, I want to say yes. I want to say yes to Jesus. When the, it comes to me, will you follow me? The answer is yes, I want to follow Jesus. However, like, like many, it, it may not just be a simple yes. And we look into uh, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, there's a record of three people that said yes to Jesus, but their yes wasn't a simple yes. It was a yes, but. The, the, the first person that we see is a guy comes to Jesus and says, I want to follow you. I'll go wherever you go. I'm in, all in. And Jesus basically says, that's your yes, but there's a but attached. You also want comfort. I'll follow you, but I want comfort as well, Jesus. 
And the second one comes to Jesus and says, I want to follow you. I'm all, I'll follow you. I'm all in. I'm in. I'm in. And he also says at the same time, but I'm really kind of big into tradition. And there's some things that I want to do traditionally speaking here before I follow you. So yes, Jesus, but I got some other things I need to, you know, prior commitments. And the last one I want to look at with you in, in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 61, it says, yet another said, I will, yes, I will follow you, Lord. And what's the next word, everybody? But, there it is, I will, but what? But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said this to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Yes, but... I want to do this, Jesus. Yes, but I, I need to do this. Or I have priorities here, Jesus, and, and they're greater than you. So sure, yes, following you, but I'm more committed to something else. And Jesus simply says, either you're all in or you're not in at all. It's a yes or a no. When you say yes to me, there is no turning back to a greater priority. The story goes uh, that in 1519, Hernando Cortez landed in Veracruz, Mexico with about 11 ships and 500 or so men. And Cortez was on a mission and he was bound to determine that this mission was going to take place. So he got everybody off the boats and they're ready to go. And in case there was anyone amongst them that may at some point say, I don't know about this mission anymore. I'd rather go home. He famously went to his fleet of ships and burned them so that there was no way home. He said, we are all in and there's no other direction. There is no turning back. And essentially, Jesus is saying to you and to me, burn the ships. When you choose to follow me, you burn the ships and there's no turning back. You're all in or you're not in at all. And so as we consider that today, what are your, our answer is going to be, yes or no? We have to know that the yes means I'm all in. There is no yes, but it's yes or it's no. And, and if your, your answer today is, yes, I do want to follow Jesus. That is what I want. I'm hungry to do that. I'm excited to do that. That's what I want to do. I am clear on what Jesus means by this. I get it. He says there's going to be change and that I need to choose and I divine my, deny myself and take up my cross. And it, it's a daily thing. It's a personal thing. It's a public thing. It's an obedient thing. And it's a radical thing. I get it. And I am still saying, yes, I've considered the cost and I know what it's going to take. It's everything in my life for Jesus, and I am in. The answer is yes. If that is you today, I have only one question left. Why? Why? Why would you choose to follow Jesus like that? The answer is really, really important. It matters. Because if your answer to the question as to why I would follow Jesus is because I go to church and it's like the right thing to do, then I would caution you and maybe even coach you to pump the brakes before you say yes. If your answer would be because I really want to get out of hell free card and I think this is how I get that, I would say, maybe hold on just for a minute. And if you would say, the reason I want to follow Jesus and do all that, because I, I really believe it's going to make my life easier, it's going to be better to have Jesus on my team, I would say, hold on. And if your answer would be, because the people around me talk about that, they think it's a good thing, and I want to fit in, or I want to make someone in my life proud so I'll do that. I would tell you, hold on and maybe reconsider. Why? 
Because none of those reasons will actually result in a life of following Jesus. Simply saying yes to Jesus does not necessarily translate to following him in real life. Those reasons instead of resulting in a life of following Jesus, will lead you to a life of frustration and a life of faking a devotion to Jesus you don't really have. And the worst thing possible could happen, that you would say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and it'd be a cold and lifeless religious ritual that at some point you say, this isn't really working, and you cast it aside, believing you actually tried following Jesus. That would be a tragedy. Too many people get this close to following Jesus and then walk away because they did not actually choose to follow him. And in all humility, I don't want that for you. There's too much at stake here. It's so much bigger and better than that. And to just get close, close enough to be inoculated is not okay. There is only one reason, one reason why you or or me, why we should ever say yes to following Jesus. Only one reason. And the only reason is because it is the only thing you can do. You can't do anything else. You have to follow Jesus. To be so gripped by the love of a God who made you and knows you inside and out and desires you anyway. To be so gripped by a grace that is not dependent on your performance and a mercy that took your punishment on himself so you could be set free and have eternal life. To be gripped by that in such a way that you have no choice but to joyfully throw your life and everything you have at the foot of Jesus and follow him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul writes these words. He says, for the love of Christ does what? Everybody? Controls. controls. That word controls there is also able, you can translate it into the word constrained in some versions. The idea is to be bound by rope around your hands, to be, to be so gripped and so in control of something else that it has you and it takes you where you're being led. You're not in charge of this. It's in charge of you. He says, the love of Christ has so gripped me. It has constrained me. It controls me. Why? Because we have concluded this, that one, that's Jesus, has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all. And here it is that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Paul says, the love of Jesus is so great in what he did for me, it's hijacked my heart. He's flying in the plane now. I don't don't even have control over this. My heart just wants to leap at him. It wants to follow him. I can't help myself but to want to follow Jesus because of his great love for me. I am so overcome that my heart has to joyfully give in to Jesus or I'm going to burst. The only thing I can do is give him my life. It's a heart that is motivated by an unstoppable response to the gospel of Jesus. This is the only reason for you and I to say yes to Jesus. When I was growing up, I, I, I went to church. My parents took me to church. How many of you guys grew up going to church at all? Um, a lot of you, but not everybody, right? Uh, a lot of us did not. Uh, I, went, I was taken to church, and I hated every minute of it. Uh, <laughs> I hated going to church. I didn't want to go to church. If I could fake sickness and get out of it, I did. It was a successful Sunday. Um, I didn't want to go to church, but when, it, when I turned 13, uh, I started going to youth group, and it was cool to go to church because now my friends were there, and we had a great time together, and I couldn't wait to hang out with my friends, so I went to church, and church was okay then. 
we went to a retreat, uh, a weekend getaway uh, as a youth group, and I was pretty excited because we got to play snow football, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and one night, a guest speaker came, and he, and he spoke to us. Now, I had grown up in the church, like I said, and I had heard about the cross. I knew Jesus died on the cross. I knew he rose from the dead. I even knew it was called Easter, and you got uh, chocolate bunnies on that day. So I loved Easter. It was great. Uh, I understood all these facts about Jesus and everything, and he came that night, and he explained for the first time in my life what all of that was actually about. And to finally understand that the whole thing centered on one concept, and that is that the God of the universe made me and loves me and wants a relationship with me. And I went, what are you talking about? God is off doing his thing and I'm doing mine. What do you mean he wants a relationship with me? And that was the whole point of Jesus' death and resurrection, the whole thing. It centered around that, that God wanted me to be reconnected with him, that I, in a right relationship with him forever and ever. And I was just uh, uh, just a wreck. I, 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 what? This didn't make any sense to me. And as he continued to explain it, I began to, to understand what he was talking about. God is totally good. There is nothing that is not good about God. He is the definition of good. If you want to know if something is good or bad, look at God. God is good and everything else is not. Like That's the definition. And he is perfect and he is holy and the reality is this, that you and I are not. Can we all agree? Everybody who would agree with me, put your hand in the air. How many of you agree that you're not perfect? If they don't have their hand up, just whisper to them, by the way, you're not perfect. Just so they know. They might need a little help with that one. Here's the deal. We're not perfect the way that God is. And none of us could ever live up and have never lived up to his goodness, his holiness, and his perfection. The, the scripture actually tells us, he says, that, that none of us have measured up to the full stature of God. It says it this way, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And when we fall short of the glory of God, we fall short of God's ways. We fall short of his character and his will. It's called sin. And all of us are in the same boat. Scriptures also say that we have all sinned. And this sin is not just a surface thing. It is a deep thing because sin has wrecked us all the way to a soul level. And there is nothing that you or I can do to undo our sin or to remove the stain of sin on us. And because of that sin, we stand guilty before God because we violated his glory and the justice for that. Scripture says is death for the wages of sin is death. That's just the reality. And it says in the scriptures that even my best effort to be righteous before God and say, look, haven't I done enough good to outweigh my bad? Haven't I kind of washed off my stain of sin? He says, no, even your best righteous deeds are filthy rags before me. You can't fix your problem. But that's where Jesus comes in. And that's what he began to understand that weekend. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says this, but he, speaking of Jesus, was pierced for whose? Our transgressions, not his. He was crushed for whose? Our iniquities, our sin. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus, God, come in the flesh, went to the cross to bear your sin and my sin and to pay for it with his very life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says this, for our sake, for your sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Je Jesus was sinless and took our sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. He took our sin on the cross and received our punishment so that we could be forgiven and that we could be made right before God with a righteousness we never could have achieved, the righteousness, the very righteousness of Jesus. When he looks at you, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and he has cleansed you from your sin, he sees the righteousness of Jesus when he looks at you. That's what he did for you. He gave everything so you and I could have a relationship with him that we don't deserve and that we certainly have not earned. So that in Christ, these things are true. That we are blameless and we are holy and righteous. We're adopted into his family. We are redeemed. We are reconciled. We are recipients of an eternal inheritance in heaven and so much more. Amen? 
That's the reality of what Jesus has done for us. That's what the cross and the grave and the resurrection was all about. And listen, when you get it, when it goes from here to here and, it, and, and you truly understand where you were and where you are because of Jesus, what was true of you and what is true of you, you get it. It gets you. When you get it, it gets you in a way that it controls, constrains, and gets a hold of you in a way it won't let go. And when it gets a hold of you, the only response is complete and total surrender to Jesus with gratitude and joy. Jesus was invited to dinner at a Pharisee's house one night. And uh, the way that you would eat at a table in those days, it was a very low-lying table. And it was called reclining at table because you would lay on an elbow with your feet extended away from the table and then eat off the table. So everybody kind of would sit around that with their heads toward the table and all the feet sticking out. Jesus was eating at this Pharisee's house and a woman, scripture says, of the city, meaning she was probably known by many of the city, living a very immoral life, came up behind Jesus as he was eating and she was weeping so hard that her tears began to wet his feet. And she took her hair and started to dry off his feet and kind of clean the dirt off his feet with her hair. And then she began kissing his feet. And then she took a jar of expensive perfume and began pouring it on his feet. Why? Why would she do that? The people that were sitting around the table were just in shock that she was doing that, that Jesus would let a woman like that do that. And why would she be so extravagant? Did she, let me ask you this, do you think she planned it out? Did she sit at home and go, okay, first I'll cry. Second, I'll wipe the hair. Like, she just knew Jesus was in there. And he loved me in a way I've never been loved. And he has forgiven me in a way I never thought I could be forgiven. So she just ran after Jesus with the most expensive thing she had and she just exploded on him. Why? Because it was the only thing she could do. Do you think she could sit at home? She knew where he was. She had to run to him and just give herself to Jesus. That is the only reason you and I should say yes to him. Because we get it to the point that it gets us and we have to do that. So how, how do we do that? If we, if we come to a place where we have, we have to give our lives to Jesus, we have to surrender to Jesus, we gotta follow Jesus, how do we do that? What does it look like? Do we just go, I'm good, God, I'm in. Like, is that it? Is that the signal? Have we accomplished it? Do we text him the emoji with a smiley face too? Because that like ups at one? Like, what do we do? Well, Jesus tells us the answer in Mark chapter one. Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So do what? Everybody, the first one, repent. And second, believe in the gospel. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is simply where God is king, where he is ruling and reigning is his kingdom. Make sense? The good news, Jesus says, is that God's good and perfect and glorious kingship is being established over broken and needy, sinful people that need a real leader, a good leader, one that's going to bring them into life. That is now available to you. That's the good news. That's the good news. And so he says, how do you receive that good news? How do you step into that kingdom where God is king over your life? You repent and you believe. And what does he mean by repent? Repent is simply 
turning from one thing to another. It's doing a 180. It's a changing of your mind, saying no longer that, this. And in this case, what it's referring to is I'm saying no longer me in charge, immorally leading my life according to my will, my design, my plan, my desires. I turn from that and I turn to Jesus and say, I'm going to completely depend on you totally to lead my life. You're in charge now, not me. You are. I am turning from that to this. I repent. I repent. It means that we unfollow ourselves and we take the role of leader that we currently occupy and we step out of it and we give it to Jesus. And we turn everything over to him. That is repenting. And the believing is more than I believe that, meaning I agree with that. To believe here is to trust in what you believe. It's to trust fully in Jesus, in his death and in his resurrection to be sufficient, complete payment for your sin. And that in so doing, it makes you completely, totally right with God. It's acknowledging that you can't contribute one little bit to taking care of your sin problem and entering the kingdom of God. It's all Jesus, only Jesus. And I trust him and nothing else in Christ alone including me, I'm not, I'm not contributing to this thing. It's all him. Jesus alone makes me right with God without my help. This is saying yes to the call of Jesus, surrendering to him as your Lord and Savior, repenting and believing. That's how we say yes. And so today, today we come to the conclusion of this fall focus. And so today is a day of choice. For all of us, for Jesus' call to you today is follow me. And there are only two answers, yes and no. I'm gonna invite the musicians, if you guys would come. And as they're coming, um, I wanna come back to the high dive. I don't wanna leave you hanging there. Actually, I don't wanna leave myself hanging there. Uh, so that day, in that swimming class after class, I was standing on the edge of that diving board and considering all of my other options as my life flashed before me. Um, and and the, the thing it really came down to was this. Who do I trust more? Do I trust Kai Tagami, my professor, that he's right and this is gonna be great, or do I trust the water to kill me? <laughs> that was really the choice I had. And I was waffling between the two. Ah, he's good, he knows what he's talking about, I trust him, except if he's wrong, I'm dead. So... And you know, standing there, I had a choice. And I finally came to the conclusion. I don't know if I'm gonna die here or not, but I trust him just enough, just enough to try this, just enough. I wasn't convinced, so much so that I actually remember my words standing on the edge of that, that diving board. I put my hands above my head. And as I started to lean back, I simply said in my heart, I said, Jesus, here I come. Because I, I thought it was over. I trusted him just enough to say yes. And I fell off that diving board. And six weeks later, when I wrote, uh, came out of the coma, it was, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It was five. No, I'm kidding again. Um, he was right. I did a perfect dive, just like a bloop, that was it. Like, woo, tens all the way around. Like it was, I came up out of the water and I went, yeah. And I, I swam over the edge, jumped out, ran back the blade, and I kept doing it over and over because it was so amazing. It was so, and then the other guys started doing that. Like, I guess he, he didn't die. I guess I can try it, thanks. But here's the thing. I, I didn't know. I just knew I trusted him enough. And today you may be saying, is it yes or is it no? How do I respond to Jesus' call to follow me? And here's the deal. I trust Jesus, but I don't know what it's going to mean exactly. What's going to happen to my relationships? What's going to happen to my time? What's going to happen to my stuff? What's going to happen if I say yes to Jesus? I don't know the answer. All I know is I trust Jesus just enough to say I'm in. You 
got it from here. I trust you. Can you say that today? I'm in. I'm going to follow you. I'm probably going to fail you. I'm going to, I'm going to fall on my face as I go. But that's why I needed your grace in the first place. I know you're going to carry me and take me through. But I am all in. If today your choice is still no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to make that choice. I, I, I simply ask you to consider why. Is it because of fear, doubt, questions you might have? And whatever it is, don't be okay with them. Seek the answer. Seek the resolution to this. There's too much at stake to simply say no and walk away. And if you would pray, I would encourage you to pray, God, please reveal what I need to know in order to say yes. And if today you would say, I, I want to say yes. But the reality is when, when I'm saying yes, it's really because I know it's the right thing to do and my heart really isn't there. There isn't this joyful compulsion to give everything to Jesus. It's just, I know I should and I want to, but my heart's not in it. What I would tell you is to simply ask God for the thing that happened so long ago in the book of Acts to happen to you, that you would be cut to the heart. In Acts chapter two, verse 37, Peter is preaching to a group of people, and, and look what, what happens. He says, now when they heard this, the good news of Jesus that Peter preaches, they were what, everybody? Cut to the heart and said to Peter and, and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Like, our heart wants to respond. What's the appropriate response? And he says, to repent and believe. But they didn't want to respond until they were cut to the heart. And so I would just encourage you today, if you're like, I get it here, but it's not cutting me here to ask God to cut you to the heart, to convict you of your need, to convict you of what he did for you when you didn't deserve it, that it would drop you to your knees today and wreck you in a way that you never recover from. Ask God to cut you to the heart. And maybe today you would say, I want to say yes. And the reason is because I came into this room as a follower of Jesus. I, I decided to follow Jesus a long time ago. And I'm just coming in. I'm saying, yes, I want to continue to follow Jesus. But let's just be honest. There are, are potentially areas in your life where even though you want to follow Jesus, you've been following Jesus, you're not following Jesus. Maybe it's in an attitude and a relationship and a decision and, and whatever it might be. And you're saying, you know what? I am not following Jesus in that area of my life. But today I'm going to say yes to following Jesus. And that means in that area too. So I'm going to repent of that. With your help, Jesus, I'm going to get mine back up. I'm going to follow you as the leader of my life in that area of my life. And maybe today you would say, I've never trusted Jesus to be the one to forgive my sin. I, I have never repented and said, I don't want to do it my way. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to lead me. But today I'm ready. I want Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I want him to come in and take over my life. I want to follow him the rest of my life until I'm in heaven, face to face with him. I'm all in. I'm ready to go. I want to give my life to Jesus. And if that's where you are today, you, you're finding your heart jumping, saying, I, I want to respond by loving him and knowing him and living for him. Then I want to give you an opportunity in just a moment to do that, to repent and to believe. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. And I'm going to come down front here, and I'm just going to kneel at the, at the front of this, the, the platform here on these stairs, just in, the, in, in a posture of humility as I, as I pray and I lead us. And if you want to join me, feel free to come up. But here's what I invite you to do. If everybody, would you all stand together? Just stand. And, and we're going to pray together, standing. And if you want to join me down here, feel free to, to come on down. And uh, as you close your eyes and, and prepare to pray here, feel free to come down. <clears throat>